We have to follow Jesus no matter what, because he is that good and he is that real. So if it comes to that question, if you're pushed to it, if it's a, somebody's mocking you at school or at work, or if it's somebody spraying mace in your eyes, the answer is the same. Jesus is good enough for whatever. He's great enough for whatever. And I'm going to follow him no matter what. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Filter. On this show, we recognize that the world can be a confusing place to live in. And so what I seek to do on this show is to equip you with a biblical worldview to make sense of our chaotic world so that you can face the chaos of life with wisdom, integrity, and courage. Uh, one of the things that makes Christianity unique among all world religions is that uh, our faith is centered around not a uh, certainly a set of teachings or a set of principles uh, or a, uh, a body of wisdom. Uh, we have those things. But what our faith centers upon most uniquely is a person, that being the person of Jesus Christ. Christ. This is what Christianity is all about. Christianity stands or falls on the person of Jesus. And I have a friend named Tom Gilson who has written an excellent book that really brings this out called Too Good to be False. This book is on the character of Jesus, his uniqueness, his goodness, uh, his consistency, and what it means for Christian belief, and also what it means for answering and providing a defense to skeptics. Tom Gilson is a senior editor with The Stream and the author or editor of six books, including most recently, Too Good to be False, How Jesus' Incomparable Character Reveals His Reality. Other books of his include A Christian Mind, Thoughts on Life and Truth in Jesus Christ, and Critical Conversations, A Christian Parent's Guide to Discussing Homosexuality with Teens. He was chief editor of the anthology True Reason, Christian Responses to the Challenge of Atheism, and he's the author slash host of the Thinking Christian blog. Tom and I got to have a great conversation in this episode about his book, Too Good to be False, talking about uh, the really amazing, unique character of Jesus. Uh, Tom really brings out some things that I'd never really considered before, some very unique insights. We talked about uh, arguments for the historicity of the New Testament and how all this impacts our life today. Uh, everything we talked about is linked in the show notes. And so if you're wanting to look into any more of Tom's work or, or uh, into his book, uh, just make sure you follow the link in the show description here to link to the full show notes and you can get all of that. Before we get into today's episode, let me encourage you, if you have not yet already, to subscribe to Filter, whether you're watching this on YouTube, listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, Google, or wherever else you might be listening to this podcast, subscribe so that you'll make sure you'll get all future episodes, clips, and whatever else uh, notified on your homepage or right there in your podcast home so that you never miss out on any of the great content that we're working hard uh, to bring you here on the show. Also, if you would like to help us out in a really easy and free way, uh, one great way that you can help us out is by leaving us a positive rating and review. If you're on listening on Apple Podcasts, for example, leaving us a five-star review and a rate and a, 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 ra a review as well, then that really helps us out uh, in the algorithm and in the charts to help other people to find this show and the message of biblical clarity through the Christian worldview. Uh, if you're listening on YouTube, like this video. And also, uh, I encourage you to leave a comment. Leave a comment on the video uh, to let us know your thoughts. If you have any questions uh, or just anything that uh, we talk about in this episode or any of our other ones brings to your mind, and I would love to interact with you in those comments. And, uh, and possibly even for some of those comments, I could get our uh, our guests to come and answer some questions you might have. I know that they often uh, look at the comments as well. And so I encourage you to do that. Let us know what you think about this show and, uh, and other episodes we have done. Well, uh, without any further delay, I'm just so excited to bring you this conversation that I got to have with my friend, Tom Gilson. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's good to be here with you, Aaron. Yeah, I agree. I've been looking forward to this. It's uh, Me too. It, it, it's been exciting uh, to get to record with you. We, we've known each other for a few years now. Met through mm -hmm. uh, the Defend Conference, the Apologetics Conference at uh, New Orleans Seminary, and uh, and I've had the privilege of uh, submitting a couple articles over the stream and working with yeah. you. 
Good stuff. Uh, there. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, I've been wanting to have you on the podcast and really excited that we are finally doing it. Um, yeah. Why don't you start, before we get into the book, why don't you start just by telling us a little bit more about yourself, uh, you know, uh, w- what you do exactly, what it means to be a senior editor at the stream and any other roles okay. that you might have uh, in your life. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, I, I tell people jokingly, I promise that I've lived more lives than a Buddhist because I've been in everything from a, a musician to a recording engineer to a human resource director at Crew Campus Crusade to a strategy mm-hmm. person with Breakpoint, the Chuck Colson's ministry. I've been a senior national leader with Rasho Christie. And uh, what ties it all together really is, is has in each of those roles, I won't go into detail, but it's been a love for learning, a love for serving leaders in particular, helping people understand whatever it is that they're trying to understand, whatever they're trying to deal with and, and pull things together in some kind of a, a pattern that can communicate that ways in ways that people can can get a grip on the world they're living in that seems to be something that god has given me the ability to do if i can focus on a situation and uh, and study it for a while oh <coughs> pardon me if i can focus on a situation study it for a while i seem to be able to find the patterns in it well in the at the stream my job is writing and editing as a senior editor what what it means to be a senior editor is that i can publish I, I don't need to ask someone else's permission to hit the publish button on a on an article. Mm-hmm. We have other editors, but I write columns. And other than a recent slowdown due to health issues and to the a death in the family, my father, I'm usually writing three to four columns a week on faith and culture and uh in how faith interacts with culture some a lot of apologetics and i bring other writers in like yourself to and and edit and work with them to to help them get their work on the stream by the way for anyone listening if you're a writer if you have good thoughts you can certainly send them to me at tom.gilson at stream.org uh, we're pretty easy to submit to and yeah uh, once you get to the submission process, of course, my question is, how's your thinking? And then mm-hmm. how's your writing? Thinking is more mm-hmm. important than writing. We can deal with writing as long as the thinking's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a little plug there. Yeah, well, and and I encourage anyone who is uh, who who's interested in going ahead and, and, and submitting. Uh, I love the stream. Loved it for years, even before I had the privilege to be able to write with you guys and. And I know I've, I've told you this just in our email correspondence, but you know I feel like every time that I've worked with you, uh, you've helped me become a better writer, and so I've always really oh, appreciated thanks. that experience. Um, and I want to mention th- too, if I may, I, if it wasn't in your intro, uh, I want to mention too, if I may, that what the stream is. We are what I would consider the go-to place for a Christian perspective on current events. We are highly committed to the truth and the reliability and the authority of Scripture. And we take that seriously as we examine what's going on in the world. And mm-hmm. and we also take culture and politics and science and, and, and the rest of it seriously. You want a serious and thoughtful look at what's going on in the world from a Christian perspective. It's, it's at stream.org. And I encourage you to visit. Yeah, I encourage our listeners to as well. Uh, like I already said, one of my one of my favorite news sources and uh, opinion and thought sources as well. Um, well, yeah, you know, in, in light of your bio and background, I think it's appropriate that you're joining us on Filter uh, because our, our goal on this show is to help people to make sense out of the world around them through the lens of the biblical worldview. And so. Uh, you have written a you're in your latest book. You've written an excellent resource to uh, help people to uh, uh, defend their faith, uh, to have greater confidence in their faith. Uh, you know, one, a, a book that we would describe as uh, an apologetics book. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this book uh, was born out of uh, kind of a unique circumstance. It was you trying to study the Bible, asking some different questions than what we typically ask. And, you know, whenever I, whenever I read that, I was immediately hooked because I love interesting questions. Mm-hmm. And so tell us about those interesting questions that you asked when you were studying the Bible that then led to 
your latest book, which is too good to be false. Sure. One of them, which may, you may not be aware of, is just I wanted to, because I do a lot of work in the conflict of faith and culture, I wanted to just concentrate on Jesus for a while. Mm-hmm. And that's what the book is about. It's about the life, the greatness of Jesus Christ, that he really is too good to be false. But the question that I asked in several chapters and in several ways is really different. I, As far as I know, I don't know anybody else who's approached a Bible study this way. I asked, what did Jesus not do? What didn't Jesus do? And this actually comes out of some of my background in crew, where I was for part of my career an internal consultant doing work with uh, our ministries in crew, of which there are many besides just campus ministries. And and my partner and I went in doing organizational and strategy assessment. And one of the things that we learned to ask was, what isn't here? We could see what was there, but in order to get a good read on an organization, you want to ask what isn't here, what's what's missing maybe, or or what's absent. Well, I started asking that about Jesus, and it wasn't, and it was in specific comparison to to other leaders in history, great leaders, and 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 great leaders in politics, in 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 movements of any kind, but especially in religion. Then I actually expanded it to other great people, not just in history, but even in human imagination. And what I discovered is that Jesus is better than anyone, not only who's ever lived, but anyone who's ever been imagined because of some of the things that he doesn't do that you might expect someone to do if they were just an ordinary great person. Excellent. So I'm sure that, you know, you found uh, a lot of surprises along the way as you were uh, doing this kind of research. Uh, what was some of the most surprising insights that you found as you were comparing Jesus to the most incredible people that we've ever seen or even imagined? Okay, I'll, I'll give you two, and then I'll, I'll just name them, and then I'll tell you what they're about. One of them is that he never used his extraordinary power for his own benefit. Another one, and there were many, but another one is that he didn't practice what he preached in one very significant area. That one was a big surprise. I'll come to it second and leave you wondering what it is. But the part, the, the one about he he never used his extraordinary powers for his own benefit is the first one that struck me, struck me, and it struck me hard. Uh, I've asked people in sessions and conferences and classes to to help me by putting a list on a whiteboard of great people in two categories and I say let's let's leave the bible out for now we'll bring it back in later list for me the the most powerful people you can think of in human history and in human imagination and they'll they'll name people like Alexander the Great and Stalin and Thanos and Zeus and uh, it's it's a it's a list like that of people mm-hmm. who can get what they want, do what they want. If they want it, they got it. Then they say, let's do another list. This list is the list of all the people who are incredibly giving, other centered, self sacrificial, and they'll name people like Mahatma Gandhi or Mother Teresa or my favorite one ever was Mom. And. And I say, okay, what do you notice about these two lists? And and the answer is, in every case, they're very different. They're, they're um, they overlap a little bit in maybe in Superman, who was a Christ figure. Um, they, but what you'd never find in history or in imagination someone who has incredible power, and who is incredibly self-sacrificial. Jesus has incredible power. Let's compare him to Superman. Superman flies through space. Jesus created space. There's a difference there. And and actually, I'm just talking about the story now. We're just talking about the quality of the character in a story. Mm -hmm. And that comes into an apologetic later of, is the story true? But in the story, Jesus is the creator of space. Um, Superman was very other-centered, but even he used his heat vision to warm his coffee. Jesus never used his extraordinary powers for his own benefit, even 
even when he was really tempted and the devil was right, he could have made bread out of the stones at the end of his 40-day fast, and he didn't. I think, and that's the one has over and over and over again just ruined me as I've thought about having that much power, the ability to do whatever I want, even if I had Mm -hmm. like tons of money, and Mm -hmm. to use it all for others' good, all of it for others' good. Jesus is incredibly good. He's way better in in that sense of his character, the indisputable, other-centered love. He's way better than anyone else that's ever been imagined by any genius or, or any life that's ever been lived. Jesus is absolutely amazing for his goodness. Yeah. I fall on my knees and I cry out. I mean, it's it's like, you must be God. You are God. I can't imagine being that good. I, that one stuns me. And that was the start of my study into things that Jesus didn't do. Yeah. Whenever you, you were explaining that, it was making me think of Philippians 2. When mm-hmm. Paul described Jesus as though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but instead emptying himself, taking on the form of a servant. Yes, that's right. And um, and and being found in his appearance as man, and then dying for us. He is the one person who, who actually chose to die for another person in this sense. Uh, more, more extreme of a choice than I think a lot of us grasp. I could choose to die for my wife. What I can't choose is not to die. In other words, if I had the the opportunity at some point to make a sacrifice for the benefit of another person, I could do that. But Jesus had the choice whether to die or not. In fact, he had the choice whether to be born or not. His, His death was was voluntary in a sense that no human's death other than himself could possibly be. That he, it was that self-sacrificial. He didn't have to die at all, yet he did. And he did it in the way he did, the, the brutally painful way that he did for you and for me. That's incredibly self-sacrificial. Yeah. I, I love him for it. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. And then the second one you said is that he didn't practice what he preached. Yeah, he didn't practice what, what he that? preached. Yeah, that makes that's him, an that makes sound not so teaser. Good. But um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll have to back off from that a little bit. That's what happens with teasers sometimes. However, uh, not completely. Here's here's the thing I, I've been asking around, and I have never heard of anybody else who has raised this question. And if Anybody listening to this has heard it from somewhere else. I want to hear about it. The question is this. Why doesn't the Bible ever say that Jesus had faith? It doesn't. There is no place in the Bible that says that Jesus had faith. This, to me, when I started looking for it, was absolutely astonishing. It doesn't say it. And I looked and I counted. He teaches faith more often than he teaches love. He teaches faith more often than he teaches any other virtue. And yet the Bible never says that he had faith or that he practiced faith. That's missing. And, and you know, Paul talks about his faith. It's not like you're not supposed to talk about faith. Um, why doesn't it say that Jesus had faith? And I've struggled with that, and I've had debates with people and saying, well, well, he did have faith. He must have had faith. Well, the Bible doesn't say so. Where I came to in that, because I don't want to leave you hanging, although you're free to think this through with me too, where I came to with that is that faith is the wrong word for it. It's it's like faith is faith is knowledge, or rather it's trust that's built on knowledge. But we use the fa- word faith when there's some question, where there's some possibility of being wrong. Um, 
you know, classically, we talk about the faith that we exercise in getting on an airplane. Well, it's because even though we are really confident the airplane will get us there, there is always a chance that it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. But, you know, then there's, then there's a different kind of trust that, you know, faith is trust. It's, they're synonymous, but let's, let's say it this way. The one I like to say is if you're in good health, if you're in good health, would you say to yourself, whoa, you know, I really trust that I can scratch my eyebrow. No. I mean, do you trust that you could scratch your eyebrow? Yes. Would you say it? No. Would you say, boy, I have faith that I could trust my eyebrow? That'd be just stupid. Okay. It's the wrong word for it. My conclusion from this is that Jesus absolutely trusted the Father. No question about that. He was not lacking in trust in the Father, but it was trust that was so complete because he had such incredibly intimate knowledge that faith was just the wrong word for it. Just like faith is a wrong word for I have faith, you know, I can trust my eyebrow. I can scratch my eyebrows. That's the only way that makes sense. It's the only way that makes sense that the word faith would be missing from Jesus' life. Yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, and, I'm still and I open think, for discussion on it. Yeah, and I think even if you were to try to com- to compare it to the type of knowledge that you have between uh, you and your spouse, or someone else that you might be extremely close to, you mm-hmm. and a sibling, you and a best friend, and you might not not necessarily use the word faith to describe your your knowledge of them and and knowing who they are right yet you know uh, unfortunately because we're fallen human beings there's still a possibility that there is something about them that you do not know or that they right. still falsely uh represent themselves to you in some way mm-hmm. uh and but that would not be appropriate for jesus between jesus and the father right. since not only did they have uh an intimate relationship um on a scale so infinite beyond anything we can understand. So there, there's that, there's the infinity of their intimacy, yeah. but also that they're one, mm-hmm. that they are one in their, uh, in, in essence, they are, they're one as God. Right. Um, and and so, there, yeah, y- even then you can't leave, th- there's no space for misrepresentation between the father and son, uh, any lack right. of knowledge there, there's complete yeah. certainty. Yeah. And, there's oneness that goes beyond, you know, I am one person, but there will be times when I'll say, I'm looking at a big project ahead of me. I'll say, I have faith I can do it. That's because I think I can do it, but I might not. Jesus is never in an I think, but maybe not situation with respect to himself or the Father. Mm-hmm. The, the word faith just doesn't fit. Yeah. Interesting. So, uh, so that's mm-hmm. one way that Jesus, that's one thing we see Jesus preach, uh, that he didn't necessarily practice, but, but, uh, that is sort of a tongue in cheek way of describing it. Yeah. Um, Right. So we've already, so these are already a couple of examples of how Jesus is too good to be false, but part Mm -hmm. one of your book is all about this. You have, you devote several chapters to, uh, to this idea that he is too good to be false. Um, what are some further arguments that you put forward in, in these chapters, which really, make up uh, what is the foundation for the book Yeah, and and, and your apologetic. Yeah, it's all about his uniqueness. He is incredibly unique and incredibly consistent. Consistent in in things that he doesn't say, for example, like he never says, thus says the Lord before he speaks. He never says our Father, except he, he tells the disciples to, but he never does. And the the first one of those, thus says the Lord, that's striking because he speaks. You read the Sermon on the Mount, for example. That's the clearest example. He speaks as if he's speaking for the Lord. The prophets in the Old Testament spoke as if they were speaking for the Lord, and Jesus spoke with the same authority that they did. But over 400 times, the prophets used the phrase, thus says the Lord. And you know, even everywhere else, that they're speaking on behalf of someone else who has the authority and who has delegated the words to them. Jesus, in contrast, he'll say, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, I say to you. He never says this, says the Lord. He says, I say to you. And he says it with the same 
sense that you need to take these as the words of God mm -hmm. and with the same strength and power and authority the prophets had. That's yeah. pretty striking. He never, ever cites a source for his own authority other than himself. Um, he never says our father. Um, there, there's a, the, the illustration I use for that in the book is imagine you've got two boys. One of them is the son of an Episcopal priest. Um, I say Episcopal because first, uh, in the Episcopal church, I often refer to the priest as father, but unlike Catholic priests, they can get married so they can have sons and mm -hmm. properly. So, so this, this, uh, they're, they're playing together, and the one whose who's, uh, dad is the, is the priest says, I wonder if we could go up and play in the belfry and just look around the church. And the other one says, uh, yeah, you should ask your dad. And he says, yeah, I'll go ask our father. Well, he wouldn't say that because he's the son. He would say, yeah, I'll go ask my dad. It's not our father. Even though one, they could both refer to him the priest as father mm -hmm. for the one who's in the family it's a different sense and he would mm -hmm. not say our father speaking yeah. with that other boy jesus had a different relationship with the father than the disciples had he was even so careful as to what did i you know okay what did i do with my bible it's right here <laughs> at the end of the book of john and um I'm trying to get there so fast, I turned the wrong direction and ended up in Ezekiel. That's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. At the end of the book of the John, he, uh, book of John, he is so careful. This is John 20, 17. Um, he's, he's talking with Mary in the garden after his resurrection, and he says, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God. <laughs> he could have said to our Father and your God so easily there, but he doesn't. Hmm. He's, what that says is he's got a very unique relationship with God, and it's consistent. These things are consistent in all four Gospels. You can, you can read a lot of skeptics who will say that there's no sign of Jesus' deity in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I say then, why didn't he say, thus says the Lord? Why didn't he say, mm -hmm. our Father? These are things that, and why doesn't any of these other Gospels say that Jesus had faith? These are things that are extremely consistent with his deity, that are extremely consistent in all the Gospels. Yeah. The signs this of his deity. Me, this makes me think of uh, C.S. Lewis's trilemma. Right, yeah. that Jesus, would, when we read the Gospels, we have to conclude that Jesus was, was either a liar, he was a lunatic, or he was the Lord. Yeah. And I think with these points that you're bringing across, that um, you know, if we, we if we were presenting this as a as a case to, uh, as an apologetic case, we would say, at the very least, we can say that Jesus perceived himself to be in a very different relationship. Oh yeah, with the Father, right? Oh yeah. Um, now, what do we make of that? Mm -hmm. And bringing in C.S. Lewis's trilemma. Can just for our, our listeners, can you bring that in the 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 yeah. trilemma and then these points, these insights yeah. that you've I can do seen that. as uh, as relevant to that argument? Yeah. Now, now C.S. Lewis was was talking about a specific question, um, and people criticize the trilemma, but it's because they criticize it for not ask, answering a different question. The question he was asking, answering was, was Jesus a great teacher? And, and he says, if Jesus was a great teacher, then he had to have been God. Because if he, he certainly made the claim to be God, he certainly acted like God, he, he lived out, he taught, and he, he, he did everything as if he was God. If he wasn't God, then he was wrong. And if he was wrong, he was either lying because he was trying to delude others, or he was a lunatic because he was deluded himself. So a man who claims to be God, yet isn't, is not a great teacher. You cannot conclude anything but that he was God, if you think he was a great teacher. Now, there's a fourth 
possibility there, which has gotten a lot of airplay, which is that, okay, it's a story. It's a legend. You know, who, you know, okay, he's a great teacher in the story. No, so what? Uh, who, who knows if he even lived? And that's what my book actually addresses. It takes the, the trilemma one step further and, and uses a similar kind of argument to show that he couldn't be a legend either. So that's part two of the book, if, if, you, uh, if this is time to move in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, and I wanted to go in that direction with, uh, with, with, with in part two, you arguing uh, the historicity mm -hmm. of uh, the Gospels, New Testament, you know, basically our, our primary witnesses to the life of Jesus. Uh, yeah. So you not only argue uh, that he is extremely great mm -hmm. in the sense of a imaginary character or he right. or that he is even the greatest possible being who could ever be imagined. Mm -hmm. but he is uh, also the greatest possible being who ever lived and was great beyond any possible imagination. <laughs> yeah, right. right? And, so, and, and so what are your arguments for? Uh, yeah. the historicity of our primary sources for the life of Jesus? Well, I start with the idea, what well, two ideas that atheists and Christians all agree on, and this part's easy. It's a story. We all agree that there's a story of Jesus. It's in four different versions, four perspectives, but they pretty much unite to tell a story of Jesus. And, and the other thing that Christians and atheists can agree on is that stories come from somewhere. And the question is, where did the story come from? Christians have our story. And, and I, I talk about a fly leaf. If, if the Bible uh, had a fly leaf on it, and especially the, the Gospels, describing who the authors were, who really wrote the Gospels, who would be on that fly leaf? Well, Christians would say that it was four individuals, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who wrote those uh, those accounts as they were either eyewitnesses or at least interviewed eyewitnesses. So they wrote them down as true reports of a man who truly lived. That's our mm -hmm. version of the flyleaf on the, on the gospels. The skeptics have their version and their version says that it's all legend. And they, and they would specifically say it's a legend that was born out of, um, and by the way, I'm, I'm pulling together different skeptics here. Not everyone would sign on to every part of this, but it's kind of the, mm -hmm. the general skeptical picture of where the Gospels came from. Is that it started with, uh, uh, the, the, uh, there was a real man named Jesus, uh, most skeptics would say. And he was pretty impressive, and he gathered a group of followers who thought that he was going to be someone great for them to follow, probably for political reasons. And then he got killed, and uh, <laughs> they were bummed. They, I mean, they were really, really dis, dis, uh, dejected. They were their their hopes were destroyed. They had put so much hope. They'd invested so much time in their lives following him. And they were left high and dry by this. The, um, the, the result of that, in a lot of people's lives, my phone just rang. I had to turn it off. I'm sorry. Um, the result of that in their lives was, and this actually happens. We've got stories of this. I read it as an undergrad, a book called When Prophecy Fails by Leon Festinger. Sometimes, I won't go into the details of that one. You've got to read the book. It is, it is the most interesting psych book ever written, When Prophecy Fails. What happens sometimes when people really invest themselves into some expected uh, thing that's going to happen, and they, and they just, you know, give their whole lives to it, and it doesn't happen, it proves absolutely false, is that they will find a way to make it true after all, because otherwise they'd have to justify um, th the lie that they'd been uh, deluded by. And so they'll make it true after all. So the disciples did that. They made a resurrection. So Jesus didn't really die after all, or he did, but, uh, but it came out even better. They made up a resurrection. When people do that, they will often, if there's no evidence for it, they'll have to find a way to shore up their belief. They'll do it by proselytizing and get other, getting other people to agree with them about it. So the disciples did that. They went out and found other people who would agree with them. And so they started spreading the church. 
Well, the church spread and it spread and it spread, starting from that really psychologically shaky foundation that wasn't true and was messed up to begin with. And it spread all over the Mediterranean basin. And Bart Ehrman, in his books, he, he's wonderful for this. He repeats it so often. He talks about it as a telephone game. Bart Ehrman's a very prominent skeptic who is one of the leaders of the legend theory and has sold a jillion books on it. He, uh, he says there's a telephone game where it's not just the, the game that you play with kids at a birthday party where one child whispers something into the next child's ear, and then it goes around the circle as they whisper in the next child's ear and the next child's ear, and you, everybody laughs when you find out at the end how different it is. It's worse than that because this is going around uh, – different languages, different religious groups, different cultures, and it's going round and round the Mediterranean. And he says at the end of this presentation, you know, many languages, many cultures, he says, what happens to stories when they get passed around that way? They change. Well, yeah, but no. I'm sorry, Dr. Ehrman. I, we were talking about the wrong word earlier. The wrong word this time, too. They get corrupted. They get destroyed. They get completely scrambled. And that's the way the skeptics think we got the Gospels, was through what I, in my book, call a story scrambler. It has to scramble the story. That's, there is no other way it could come out of that process but scrambled. And yet it landed not just once, but four times in the account of a man who was perfectly consistent in these very objectively definable ways and better than anyone has ever imagined in any other literature, especially in his love. You don't get that out of a story scrambler. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm convinced that the legend theory is wrong. And if the skeptics want to come up with another naturalistic explanation for the Gospels, let them. But that one has failed on this ground, I am convinced. It fails on other grounds, too. There are lots of other reasons in, in uh, historical studies and so on to demonstrate that the legend theory has a lot of problems with it. My answer to it is unique in that you can get to this one without having to know the rest of the history. You can get it just from knowing what's in the Gospels and a little bit about human nature and a little bit about what the skeptics teach. And you go, okay, here's what the Gospels have. Here's human nature. Here's what skeptics teach. That doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. And it really, really fails to fit. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it seems as though when you read the various uh, skeptical uh, counter arguments to, uh, you know, belief in the historicity of the New Testament, that uh, they really do fail to explain the evidence, right? They do. As we see it, if we are mm -hmm. attempting to take these stories, as you said, read them seriously yeah. uh, and, and say, okay, what explains the 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 testimony that we have here mm -hmm. the strongest explanation by far is that these were eyewitnesses recording what they had seen yeah uh, which is what john reiterates in his uh in his first letter he I, said he said we right. i'm writing to you about what we saw what we touched what we what we what we experienced right mm -hmm. uh, that's right not, not just an illusion not just an idea but a reality that they experienced Mm -hmm. Skeptics will often say that they can construct the, the story of Jesus out of other myths. <laughs> and that's, we could go into why that's wrong. Um, yeah. Uh, because they don't do a good job of that. Certainly not as good as they pretend they do. But when yeah, that, even that's why the I can't best help that they chuckle do, whenever I hear that argument, I know it's the it's, best it's they really ever silly. do though when yeah. they do that is they can reconstruct plot points. When you talk about the character of Jesus, mm -hmm. that, that that that's really out of reach. That's way out of reach. There is no parallel to the character yeah. of Jesus, and they'll also say, "Well, there are inconsistencies in the story," and I say. 
okay, there are some twigs that don't match. The forest is identical, which is that there are so many places, I mean, not so many places, rather, there are so many ways in which the character of Jesus remains consistent. There are I mean, going around the Mediterranean, wouldn't somebody have thought, oh my goodness, it never says Jesus has faith. We better put that in. He never says, us says the Lord. We better throw that in. Mm -hmm. Somebody would have put that in there somewhere. Yeah. And it never happens. Yeah. Or even or even some of the things that you know we often refer to as like the embarrassing details. Yeah. It seems like at some point if they were fabricating a story or or even trying – or uh, even if it wasn't a, a whole cloth fabrication, if it was like you were saying – a, uh, a psychological mechanism to justify mm -hmm. their a failed prophecy. They it seems as though there would have been some polishing. We could say yeah, uh, right. maybe some uh, some polishing of Jesus's uh, humble origins, his lack right. of uh, theological training, mm -hmm. his uh, or you know formal theological training, uh, his, uh, certainly his crucifixion. <laughs> You know, oh, yeah. for, you know, never mind the 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 specific gruesome details and uh, the the horror of what he cried out on the cross, but just yeah. that he was crucified to begin with. Yeah, right? that's, I mean, that was early Christians experienced. Yeah, early Christians experienced severe mockery that they worshipped somebody who was crucified. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. You know, you think that. Uh, so so if there was something to the legend hypothesis, um, it, it really doesn't line up with this extremely realistic presentation that we're given uh right. with all of the as i said before maybe it's not the best word but the embarrassing details and so sure on. Uh, even the failures of the apostles themselves yeah and you know that, and, that and, peter's <laughs> multiple blunders would have been kept in uh as he was the spokesman of the church and by the right. way it's the same peter in all four gospels mm -hmm. too and he's the one person whose character is most apparent in all four Gospels, and he is exactly the same Peter in all four Gospels. He wasn't whitewashed by any of the um, telephone game players. Mm -hmm. You'd think one of them would have yeah. if there was a telephone game. Yeah. So you, you've already mentioned interaction with skeptics, and one of the things that I appreciate about you, Tom, is that uh, you don't just write about apologetics, but you do apologetics. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that you interact uh, very, very much online and through, you know, various, uh, various different media with, uh, with, with skeptics of all different kinds um, mm -hmm. on various arguments, but also responding to, uh, to criticisms, criticisms of your own work. Yeah. Uh, in your various interactions, what have been some of the skeptical pushbacks to uh, this book? I, the most serious one, I've had some that were actually funny where they, the guy basically made my case for me. I'll, if we have time, I'll come back to that. But the most serious one is Jesus wasn't so good after all. Maybe being self-sacrificial is kind of a character weakness, or maybe hmm. Jesus should have told people, you know, if he was really God, he should have taught people to boil their rags before they put them on a wound. Or maybe Jesus should have uh, said yes to homosexual marriage, or maybe Jesus this, or maybe Jesus that. And I have ways to answer each one of those, um, but they they tend to go into some, especially the the gay marriage one. They they tend to go into a whole lot of depth and and a whole lot of work. The simplest answer to to that complaint is. Okay, you can say that, but we still have the single most obviously self-sacrificial person in all of literature and all of history. So let's pretend that the complaints that you're talking about are worth listening to. Let, let's, let's compare that to, and let's say that's like the sand on the beach. It's kind of just worthless stuff you walk through. It's kind of nice it's there maybe, but <clears throat> it's not worth anything. And you're walking along the beach and you stumble upon a diamond. And Jesus' character, especially his self-sacrificial goodness, is a diamond. It is absolutely unique. So this would be like a this would be like a 50 carat diamond, an absolutely completely unheard of diamond. And you pick it up and you toss it aside and you say, Yeah, there's diamond here, but look at all the sand. I say, we still 
have to ask questions about that diamond, don't we? Doesn't that diamond have something to say to us? Mm. Where did Jesus absolutely unparalleled character come from? And if you can answer that in naturalistic terms, then you've got an argument against my case. But if not, the case still stands. And mm. also, part of the case is not just his goodness, but his consistency. The fact that, for example, thus says the Lord never shows up. Whether mm -hmm. that's good or not, you know, it just never shows up. It, how did it come out so consistent? Mm -hmm. That's one example. There are many, by the way. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's actually a really interesting objection. I hadn't heard that. Um, I, I hadn't heard that objection to your book. Before, mm -hmm. which obviously I haven't been uh, receiving the objections like you have, yeah. uh, but I think that's actually really interesting because uh, it makes me think of how you know, um, in a sense, f in the history of the world and for any culture that has not been touched by Christianity, uh, self sacrifice as we see it in Jesus isn't necessarily a virtue, right? Uh, and it was certainly a new virtue in the Greco Roman world. Mm -hmm. uh, because <laughs> self-sacrifice on behalf of your country, on behalf of your brothers, that would be seen as virtuous, right? Mm -hmm. we, we see that in the uh, Greek writings and the Roman the virtues and so on. Uh, but, to, but to be a Roman who would die on behalf of the barbarians, right? Or as Paul yeah. said in Romans 5, to anyone would die for your friend, but to die for your enemies. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that degree of a self-sacrifice, that yeah. I think that was a brand new virtue. It was uh, it entered onto the world stage, and 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 a brand new virtue that enters any single culture that Christianity touches for the first time. And so, what that points out is, it's interesting. We're actually, whenever we're evaluating, is Jesus good or not, we're doing so from within a context, uh, within 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 a culture, an ecosystem which has been formed. Uh, a, a sense of morality which has already been formed by Jesus's character. Yeah. Because this person has been so incredible and unique in world history that he has uh transformed culture, societies, civilizations so that today we're living in a context mm -hmm. where even in the 21st century um to a, to a very large degree many of our values are still shaped by him. And That's are directly right. directly due to him in, in, in his word, the the Bible, and so, might, uh, and so I think. That, so anyway, I just think that's interesting how this criticism that people bring up, uh, saying, "Well, maybe he wasn't all that good," because what makes mm -hmm. that good? Maybe in a roundabout way, kind of goes back to supporting your argument, right? That it we're could. we're doing this from within a context <laughs> that's shaped by his life, or or they might say, "Well, that's circular." Then you're you're using his standard. <clears throat> Pardon me. They might say that's circular. You're, you're using Jesus' standard to, sh to mm. ask whether Jesus lives up to Jesus' standard. And I say to that, no, I, I'm actually using a standard of love, and it's mm. and it's love that is bigger than love for kin. He is. This is a standard of love that that far exceeds any other standard of love. And if you don't think love's a virtue, Maybe you won't be impressed by Jesus. I can't help that. We'll talk yeah. about his consistency instead, the, 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 which still doesn't fit with the atheist uh, explanation of, of the so-called legend. But um, I, I, I think love's a virtue. And Jesus certainly displayed it like no one else in history or literature. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's something that I would concede that, you know, it, it might be a, a little circular. But, mm -hmm. but once again, just I think the fact that we can't escape any other greater standard to compare Jesus to than, the, than his own life. Right. Right. Has yeah. to say something about his greatness. It does. And my like goodness. Like you said, finding a diamond on the beach. We can't find a diamond that rivals in the beach of, of world religions and leaders yeah. and political leaders. We cannot find a diamond that rivals Jesus. And and the the one story the one that, that where the I thought it was kind of funny the atheist objected he he was listening to an interview I was doing with someone else Frank Turek where I talked mm -hmm. about 
the uniqueness of Jesus' story in another sense, which is that Jesus had no character development in the sense of character growth. Oh, yeah. He was every other really interesting story in history has a struggle in, in where someone's really struggling through a problem and they have to grow through it. Well, Jesus started out already f- character fully formed and perfect. Mm-hmm. Well, this atheist said, ha, that's just awful. I can't believe you think that's a good story. Sto- p- stories with perfect characters are boring. And he went on and on and on about this. Well, he didn't realize that I'd already written four pages saying the same thing. St- stories with c- perfect characters are boring. So what happened to this perfect character who should have been boring that billions of people down through history have worshipped him, have considered him his story the most compelling story ever, who would die for him? This is not the result of a boring character. Jesus should be boring since he's perfect. He isn't. That makes his story unique in another sense. And and by the way, how did these crazy mixed up people in their telephone game produce a character who, as you just said, changed the moral course of history? Mm-hmm. How did they do that? I, that's just awfully good work. If you can do that. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, a, yeah. that's, that's more miraculous than a resurrection, if you ask me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So in the third part of your book, in your book, you go into, uh, I guess what we could call some somewhat of a uh, practical application, but just yeah. relevance to real life mm-hmm. of what the arguments in your book, Too Good to be False, means. Uh, you know, what the greatness and uniqueness, the consistency of Jesus's life means for us today. What do you mm-hmm. see as the relevance of this book's argument oh. to Christians living uh, yeah. in our context today. My goodness, yes. You know, just last weekend, there were people praying in Portland, and Antifa showed up and sprayed them with mace and pepper spray and destroyed their sound system and all kinds of things. We are in a in a new stage, a new phase of Western culture. It's been true in other parts of the world and other times in history, but it's really new for us, where... In their case, they had to say, am I willing to follow Jesus no matter what? And other people are having to answer that question in other contexts. They're having court cases here in the news. Others maybe not in the news. I think it's on the increase. I think that you and I are going to be asking, am I willing to follow Jesus no matter what? That's the title of my third section, by the way, is Jesus no matter what. Mm Mm-hmm. And I and I, I come down to the conclusion that I have to follow Jesus. I want to, because he did live the only perfect human life ever lived. He is the best example for life. <clears throat> he did die for my sins. He did rise from the dead. He did love me and does love me perfectly. He is the one with the words of eternal life, as Peter said, when a similar question was asked of him at the end of the sixth chapter of John. Um, We have to follow Jesus no matter what, because he is that good and he is that real. So if it comes to that question, if you're pushed to it, if it's somebody mocking you at school or at work, or if it's somebody spraying mace in your eyes, the answer is the same. Jesus is good enough for whatever. He's great enough for whatever, and I'm going to follow him no matter what. That's the real application for me. Yeah, that's excellent. And I, and I think that just the, uh, the the challenge and the power of that mm-hmm. that third section and, uh, and, and what you just said uh, highlights something for me that, that I think we don't um, talk about often enough, which is that uh, we always approach apologetics as though it's just uh, an ivory tower exercise that it's only yeah. uh, for intellectuals and it has nothing to do with real life. But, but I think what you're, what you're doing in this book and, and as you just shared here uh, re- really pushes back against that and it shows how no, whenever we, 
uh, how apologetics can have a very, very real impact on our life. It can have a real strengthening oh, of our yeah. faith that gives us a, a, a steely fortitude against the pressures of the world around us, which uh, I, I agree with you. I think that as, as the pressures of the world around us continue to grow and intensify, Christians are going to have to decide that Jesus is good enough, that he's he is glorious enough and that uh, and that he he's the pearl uh, far more valuable than any other treasure. And so holding on yeah. to him, no matter what we face in the world, is always going to be better. That's right. That's a good word. I like how you put that. Yeah. Well, uh, well, you put it first. I just <laughs> you said it first. I just restated. Um, I, I'm just I'm so appreciative of this book. I think it's really interesting. Uh, like I said at the beginning, I Whenever somebody asks me an interesting question, I'm, I'm immediately hooked. I love mm-hmm. good questions, and mm-hmm. uh, and I think that the that this book is just a a uh, just shows how uh, some great things happen when we ask good questions. So I want to thank you for this book. Thank you for your time sharing about it. Uh, before we go, are there any other uh, are there any other projects or any other works? Any anything else that that you have done or that you are doing right now that you want to point people towards? As we oh, there's a, move towards yeah. the end here, there's a bunch. Um, 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 I'll I'll just stick with one, which is my my blog, which I've been doing a lot longer than I've been writing at the stream. The blog is Thinking Christian, ThinkingChristian dot net, ThinkingChristian dot net, and the cool thing about this is if you want to get a free down or actually a preview of the reviews on this book which have come in amazing the reviews from Lee Strobel, JP Moreland, Gary Habermas, Eric Metaxas and more mm-hmm. you can find them there but even more fun you can just um and you can you can just sign up for uh, for the newsletter and get a free chapter of the book to download so if you want to download a chapter of the book, go to thinkingchristian.net and you'll see a subscription form or sign up form or it'll pop up after a while as pop-ups do happen on screens. And you can sign up and, and it'll automatically send you a, a free download of chapter on Jesus' astonishing love, which we've been talking about here. So that's at thinkingchristian.net. I'm also doing some other work to help specifically with churches and pastors navigate the complications of this age, but that's um, that keeps getting delayed for crazy reasons, and I'm mm-hmm. still pushing forward on it, but I, I wish I could announce more on it. Um, that one's um, a lot of pushback on that. If you would pray for me on that, I would appreciate it, because I think it's spiritual battle. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, very often when we're doing something that's very meaningful, it comes with a lot of struggle. Yeah. Uh, both spiritual issues, you know, spiritual warfare, and uh, and then just, uh, yeah, the struggles of life, I find. So I'll, I'll be oh, praying right. for you, yeah. and I'd ask that our listeners would as well. And Thanks. I'll be, uh, and for anyone who's listening who's interested in following your blog, uh, following you on social media, uh, finding your book, anything else, uh, mm-hmm. all of that is going to be linked in our show notes. And so Thanks. if they uh, follow the show notes in the link, in YouTube or uh, in whatever podcast platform they're listening to, they'll be able to get all that in the uh, show notes. So just look for that link and you'll be able to get all that stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. Tom, I just want to thank you once again so much for taking the time to spend with us today on Filter. I really enjoyed the conversation and, uh, and I know we, we could go a lot longer talking about Jesus, his greatness and, uh, and, mm-hmm. and the New Testament. Maybe we'll get to do this again one day, but uh, thank you for joining us on Filter today. Well, thank you, Aaron. It's good to be here. Thanks for listening. I hope this episode provided you with biblical clarity to live with confidence in our confusing world. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating or review. To catch up the latest from me, you can go to my website, AaronChamp.com. While you're there, subscribe to my newsletter so that you can be updated anytime I share new content. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Aaron M. Champ. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Until then, hold fast.